Good morning, everyone. Good morning. First of all, I'm just going to read a, a short story. Once in a quaint village, nestled between rolling hills and dense woods, there lived an ambitious architect named Clara. She dreamt of erecting structures that sang harmonies with nature rather than disrupting it. Clara was not just building homes. She was crafting symphonies of brick, glass and green. The village buzzed with excitement about her revolutionary ideas. This was the boom and Clara was at its heart. But as the structures began to rise, so did challenges. Traditional builders scoffed at her techniques. Materials were scarce and funds began to dwindle. Doubt and uncertainty clouded the village's initial enthusiasm. The bust had arrived, threatening Clara's dreams. In this dance between her soaring ambitions and the sobering realities, Clara's tale mirrors the journey of sustainable constru construction in our world today. Welcome to you all, dear listeners. I'm your host, Keith Maidley. Some of you may know me as Mr Yorkshire through my website which helps companies lift their profile in the county and marketing these children's educational books to corporate Britain. But today our guest is a gentleman I've known for many many years, David Bradley Bowles. When I was regional chair of the Prince's Trust many few years ago, David was one of our mentors. He then came and introduced me to his business partner Kevin Pratt and told me about their new idea of building these wonderful green energy efficient homes. And now, David, I'll ask you to take it from there and tell us the story. Oh, good morning, Keith. Good morning, listeners. Um, so yes, my name's Dave Bradley Bowles and I'm director of Pure House. Um, the story you've just uh, read really does sort of resonate with, with Pure House and the team. Um, you could go as far as to say that the architect Clara is actually our architect, Claire, um, it's such a sim the similarities are, are very strong there. Um, it resonates itself uh, with myself. So as a teenager, uh, I actually spent a year living in the rainforest and growing up, I uh, had a deep connection uh, with the outdoors, spending many weekends camping and just living outdoors. Um, as a student, I went on to study engineering uh, and beyond that, as an entrepreneur, uh, I became fascinated with um, property investing. So going back to 2018, and um, so five years ago, um, I'm going to say the stars aligned for myself, where all of a sudden I realized that the conservationist in me, the engineer in me, and the property investor in me could all align uh, the values, the interests, and I want to say, the, go as far as saying the obsession. Um, and Pure House came about to build sustainable homes. And for the last five years, uh, myself and Kevin and, and team around of us have dug in really deep to engineer, design, you know, we've done all the research and start to prove that actually there is a very, very viable um, business proposition for building sustainable homes. Uh, we've proven that now over in uh, Bradford, Oakenshaw, where we built our first two sustainable homes there. They were our par uh, pilots. Um, and from there, we're now progressing on to build 20 homes at Drillington to show that this business model can be scaled up and is appropriate if we are going to tackle climate change. Um, there are many, many different strategies that need to be applied, whether you're in the automotive business, whether you're in the coffee business or you're in the construction business. And we're doing our part to revolutionize and change and drive the energy um, that is needed to take what is, I'm going to say prehistoric systems, mm. whether it's the planning, the legals, even traditional construction. Um, the big driver for me back in 2018 was actually being in the, the crossfire of traditional construction. On one side of me, I'd got um, construction workers. And on the other side of me, I'd got the, the professional um, design and architectural teams, the QSs, the financing people. Um, and the reality was, um, I go as far as saying it was a bloodbath, I was certainly in, in the uh, line of fire and it really wasn't a pleasant environment, a pleasant industry. And I just see that there is um, long overdue change in construction. And it was the best decision that we ever made was to, to, to realign ourselves with our values and pursue not what we thought we could make money on in the next two years, 
not even three years, but we were aiming for, let's build homes how we expect them to be built for 2030. Um, and to our surprise, you can do that now, and it's a business, and it's profitable. Um, and we now find ourselves amongst the, the trailblazers in the country. Um, and the people around me are all tightly aligned with their values too. Um, and it's probably the most exciting space I've, I've ever found myself working in. Um, every day, the team, the people that I engage with on this project come with huge amounts of energy and they take on some of these massive challenges. Um, we titled it Boom and Bust and yeah. the story there of Clara. Yeah. It's, it's, it's definitely that, you know, we, we have some seriously big challenges, but we do look to see how we overcome them and we can see on the horizon uh, an exciting future. David, that, that's great. I do remember right from the start, you mentioned in Openshaw, because I was born in Bradford and I thought a, a great one for Bradford actually would be number one. Um, and then when you um, spoke to me recently and you'd got Driglington, you're now talking of 20. I mean, that's, uh, that's marvellous. That's uh, a real development, much. isn't it? Um, do you think, is it time now for low carbon technologies? Is the market ready? Can they compete with traditional build methods? Uh, what are the market trends, David? So if we start looking at the technology and we take the perspective of the investor, um, yes is the answer. Um, what is low carbon technology? Um, listeners, feel free to add to the, the comment box here, actually. Mm -hmm. What do you think sustainable construction is? Because this is where I always start with people when it's like, oh, is it the time now? Can we invest in that? It's like, well, let's understand what we're investing. So I'm going to turn the question to you, Keith. Um, what do you think an eco home is? Uh, well, I suppose in some respects, um, having watched your model, I, I, I'm, I'm just like amazed. Biased already, yeah, I do. I've got the story, uh, but I think what amazes me, and I've told so many people, David, uh, when you mentioned uh, if that you know there's no heating system, I and mean, if you go in in the winter and perhaps it's just a little chilly, your hair dry for five minutes and the, the house is heated, and people just go what. So, you know, it's a great story. Yeah. Wonderful. So if we're thinking about technology and whether or not it's ready and this concept that, mm. yeah, your house could be heated mm. by a hairdryer <laughs> or your tenants or, you know, however we go about this or what you're selling to your end user, um, it does sound crazy. And people have um, quite blatantly uh, made it clear that they think I was crazy for exploring this and going down this road. But when we look at state of the art and we look at technology mm. and, and we come back to what is a sustainable home? Well, there are the two key things to consider. And the first thing I want to do is I want to draw a line right down the middle between fabric first, the building, okay, building a good yep. quality building and renewable energy. Mm. Everybody talks about solar panels. They talk about air source heat pumps. They talk about that being sustainable. That's only 50% of the technology. Now, I had to look up the definition of state of the art, if I'm using that phrase, to, to, to consider whether or not it was appropriate. And I do feel that it's appropriate, but because we're only using timber, mm. insulation, tapes, glazing, ventilation systems, I don't see anything in there that, as an engineer, I would say, oh, that's technology, that's revolutionary, that's mm. it. But what it is, is we bring it together and we build it in a way that nobody else is doing it. And when I say nobody else, I'm talking about the 99.9% .9 of the market out there. Um, for the last 30 years, so going back to 1991 in Germany, um, a chap called um, Wolfgang Feist decided he was going to prove this. So we've got well over 30 years mm. worth of research uh, and development and track record now that building fabric first works. So let me give you an analogy about mm. building fabric first. So if you were in the Arctic, Baltic, freezing, what would you rather? Would you rather be stood in front of a nice bonfire uh, naked to keep warm? Or would you trade that bonfire for the best winter clothing that you could find? Mm, a very interesting point. I think I, I think I'll probably go for the clothing. <laughs> go for the clothing. Right. Let's compare this with construction. Yeah. Yeah. Traditional builds, mm. I'm going to equate to an anorak. It's not going to keep you warm in winter. All right, it keeps the rain off you yeah. at best. And what do we do? We turn on our gas boilers and we heat it up. Mm. But then we just let the heat just pass straight out the building because we're wearing the equivalent of an anorak. It's not designed to keep us warm. Our homes in the UK are not mm. designed to keep us warm. In Europe, they are. They're building these, you know, by the thousands. Yeah. You know, they know how to build homes to keep them warm. Um, 
On the flip side of that, you know, you go down, you buy this amazing winter jacket. So you wrap your building in a highly insulated um, coat. Um, you then make it airtight so you're not drafty. That would be the equivalent mm -hmm. of doing your zip up on your coat. Yeah. Put your hood up, pull your drawstrings yeah. down. You're starting to keep yourself warm. If you do a building highly insulated, um, highly airtight, you're now starting to move into the territory of issues with damp and mold. Mm -hmm. Everything's got to breathe. Yes, of course. But we just bring in, I'm going to say, a simple uh, ventilation system mm -hmm. because technology wise, it is simple. Mm -hmm. But they are amazing. We call them MVHRs, so it's a mm. mechanical ventilation heat recovery system. And what this does is it extracts all the uh, the steam, the moisture, the pollutants, everything that's going on in your kitchens, your bathrooms, um, your utility spaces. It dumps it outside. But before it dumps it outside, because you know that's what a normal extractor yeah, yeah. does in a normal house, it actually puts it through this cool little honeycomb system. And as it puts the air through the honeycomb system, it draws in fresh air from the outside. Yeah. Now, it's going to filter out that air as well. So if you've yeah. got a motorway next to you, let's get rid of all of those yeah. motorway air pollutants. So we'll filter that cold air coming in. Put it through the honeycomb, and now the heat exchanges between the incoming air and the outcoming air. The efficiency of these are amazing. We're talking 90-plus percent recovery of the heat going out, getting kept back in the building. Well... Yeah, I, I, that's that's incredible, isn't it? When when all, every day we're reading about fuel poverty, and and the cost of heating homes. So, I mean, you you were on, you're really really ahead of the agenda. Yeah, that's it. So to finish off the fabric yeah. first, we replace our double glazing with triple glazing. Just better. And yeah. Why wouldn't you? It's a simple process. Mm. And I'll be honest with you, the cost isn't that different these no. days. Yes, we don't have a supply chain in the UK that's very good. So we've been procuring ours from abroad. Um, but they're there and they're affordable and mm. you know, I tell you what, the quality is amazing. Mm. Um, and we, we consider about how we face the building. Do we face it north? Do we face it south? We have small mm. windows on the shaded side, big windows on the, on the sunshine. Now you mentioned about being cold, um, you know, on those chilly days in the hairdryer. I tell you a bigger risk, overheating. Yeah. Now most yeah. people don't think about that or ask that. So we do need to think about that when we're designing a house with big south facing glazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we use an amazing piece of software called the PHPP. That for me is the technology. That's the software. So before you embark on any journey like this, check out the PHPP, design it, analyze it, then build. If we don't do it that way around, mm. very easy to overspec your house. So if you'd said to me you thought um, Essel's heat pump was part of the solution and you built a passive house then put one on there, that's £15,000 wasted. Mm -hmm. so you don't need one. Mm -hmm. But did you do your analysis before you started building? So um, I talked about renewables and I said, let's draw a line down between the two. Renewables are brilliant to finish off the job. So we build something that barely needs any energy, barely needs any heating energy. You're radiating now probably 150 watts of heat from you. Yeah. So, you know, we're sat in here. We've mm. got a, a new in the background there uh, doing his technical. There's three of us. There's best part of 500 watts of energy in this room. So it will get warm in here in no time at all. Yeah. That's how a passive house is heated. And that's why we use the word passive, actually. So some of the investors that are, are on uh, listening now, they'll be very aware of passive income. It's about doing it itself. Mm. Set it up, let it do you its thing. It, yeah, excellent. The homes do the same. So once you've got this low energy home, you need a tiny little top up. Where do we go for that? Mm. Go on. Solar panels. Yep. Solar yep. panels, air source, heat pump, you know, you, you, yeah, you yeah. take your pick, ground yeah. source. There's lots of things. The exciting product we're going to be using in um, Spring Meadows, the 20 yeah. homes up in Drillington, um, is called a thermopod. Mm -hmm. And Thermopod, it's, it's nowhere near as expensive as an air source heat pump. It's going to bring in enough renewable energy to do all the hot water and give us a few little towel radiators, things like that, heated up. And it's perfect for this job. Brilliant. Brilliant, David. David, what social trend Sorry, are you using? Excuse me, Anu. Anu? <laughs> Sorry if you're getting feedback on the line there. David, what social trend are you seeing in the market? There's a lot of talk about sustainability, whether, you know, ditching plastic or um, eating um, whole foods, saving the Amazon. Are the social pressures enough to really make a change? Yeah, I mean, as an investor, that's what you're looking for. Get your timing right. It's great that the technology is there, but, mm. you know, is the consumer ready for it? 
Um, yeah, I mean, if you look at the coffee market, yeah, you know, the coffee market boomed in the early 2000s. Uh, I remember being offered an opportunity to invest into a coffee shop. Uh, we did the maths and it all looked exciting and, you know, it never came of anything. But you look back and go, wish I'd got in the coffee market at that point. That would have been, you know, that would have been, yeah. where would I be now? Yeah. Um, so socially, you know, people wouldn't have considered spending £3.50 on a coffee back then. Um, it was, why would you do that when for a few pennies you can get Nescafe? Mm. But what the market is, has, has progressed to do, and I'm talking about now, I'm going to say the rising middle class, is that we enjoy the luxuries that we can afford. We like having disposable income. We like buying the extras. We do it because we want to. Um, when we looked and, and built our prototype homes and we put them up for sale, part of that process was, let's see how demanding mm. uh, the market is. We were having people from Preston... Oh. And beyond saying, I want to have a look at the house and I'm thinking about moving to Bradford for that house. Yeah. What's this place open sure about? Yeah, yeah. You know, they were the questions we were getting. So they weren't on right move buying by postcode. They were looking for the house. Um, we had buyers that said, you know, since the first Grand Designs episode I ever watched 15 years ago, I've been wanting this. Wow. This is the first yeah. time I've seen a house this caliber to the market. Yeah. Um, and that's, that story just went on and on and on and on. And, you know, 40, 50 miles people mm. were traveling to see the homes. Um, so in this early phase, you know, the innovators, the adopt, early adopters, they want this and they're prepared to change their lives to get it. Yeah. You can liken it to a Tesla in that sense. Mm. You know, mm. people are prepared to sit on the long waiting mm. lists for them. They're prepared to pay the extra disposable income to acquire them. And why? You know, they could get a Nissan Leaf for a hell of a lot less money. Yeah. <laughs> so the social aspect yeah. of it is, is there. Um, and the demand's coming from the buyers. Now let's have a, a, a look at a more pressing and a really, really big damaging uh, issue in, in the economy. And, and that's fuel poverty. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Ukraine. It, it yeah. was crazy what we saw energy yeah. prices go Absolutely to. Absolutely incredible. Um, Mind-blowing. Yeah, I mean, uh, not to be disrespectful to anybody in any sense, but... I spoke to the buyers of our homes during that period, and there was an element of smugness. They were just like, yeah, we don't really have any energy bills. It's not <laughs> affecting us. You know, we're paying an extra five pounds per month or, you know, their energy yeah. bills might be something like a hundred pounds a year, yeah. 150 pounds a year. Um, whereas obviously you live in a detached house in North Leeds and I'm going to say on average, you're probably paying closer to 500 pounds a month in your energy bills. So, Fuel poverty is a really, really big issue, and the government know this. They know that um, more and more people are in this really unfortunate position of, of being forced into fuel poverty. And it's something that we've got to address, and mm -hmm. here is a solution. Mm. You know, housing associations, councils, yeah. they want affordable homes that are built to very address this very, issue. Very much so, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, you imagine how life-changing it is if you, you got taken from an old ex-local authority mm. house and placed into a brand new passive house. Mm. Uh, you had no en energy bills. But on top of that, you've got purified air. You've got an abundance of, yeah. of light. Yeah. You live in a comfortable space. So all those um, damaging health factor um, issues that arise yeah. from living in cold or overheated spaces... Um, you know, the NHS is burdened with people living mm. in fuel poverty because mm. of the impact it has. True. So the government know, um, and local authorities, the NHS know, that if we can improve the way people live, mm. the burden on the NHS will be mm. down. Mm. Now that is a massive market. Oh, incredible. So, incredible. So, so the economic trend you're seeing in the market, David, we touched on fuel bills, uh, electric cars. Do you feel people will pay more for better? Um, we'll pay more for better. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you go back to my analogy about the, you know, a winter coat, you know, people will pay for quality. Um, people will buy coffee, people will pay the extra that it costs for a Tesla. So we are seeing um, that people are making social decisions. And despite the economic, mm -hmm. um, what is it, the economic, not challenge, but debate. So plastic toys, I'm a father of two, got two um, yeah. wonderful little kids, two and four. And at birthday times and Christmas times and christenings, we're getting swamped with toys. Mm -hmm. And the reality is we don't want those plastic toys mm -hmm. for the kids. Mm -hmm. We'd rather them have fewer, but, you know, wooden toys, better, yeah. you know, yeah. better toys that are yeah. more robust. They're not, you'd, you know, I walk into the kitchen in the morning, still fast asleep, and I step on a toy and it's broken, it's in the bin, it's lasted yes. five minutes. And I think from a society point of view, we're starting to recognise 
that actually buy better quality, last longer, um, is better for the environment. This whole culture of um, passing on items as well, mm -hmm. re-gifting. Yeah. Imagine the idea yeah. of re-gifting five yeah. or ten years ago. Yeah. Um, I quite regularly have conversations with other parents and, and mm. family, and they say, don't worry about the kids for their birthday. Mm. Just, just re-gift them something. Mm. Um, so people are thinking about their financial decisions. Um, now, there's a, there's a fantastic book that um, I studied recently, and it talks about, you, you know what a black swan event is, yeah. I'm assuming, yeah? So, um, you know, catastrophic financial mm. um, plummet in the markets, um, once in a lifetime type thing, you know, mm. no one saw it coming. Yeah, 1987. Of, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have you ever heard of a green swan? Go on. A green swan. A green swan is the most beautiful thing you are ever going yeah, to yeah, see. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I say you are ever going to see, and it's on the horizon, it's coming. Right. And it's almost like a, a, a phoenix is rising mm. type thing. So you have a disaster, you know, yeah. you have a black swan event. You know, you look back over the last decade, you know, mm. what we've gone through or last two decades. Yes, yeah, very much. You know, between economic crisis, uh, low interest rates to, to try and keep the economy yeah. going, yeah. into pandemic, you know, it's just one thing after another. And the entire time the government's been stoking it, trying to keep it going, trying to play all the economic yeah. games. Um, but you, you take, you know, the pandemic, you cannot have a period of low productivity without pain after. Mm, absolutely true. Yeah, very, um, very true. And we went into a boom. Yeah. That was, yeah. It was crazy, absolutely mm. crazy. Uh, you know, and I'm thinking as an investor here. So the, going back to the green swan, and the green swan is, this investment now is starting to go into renewables. It's starting to go into um, selling to this market of people that actually want to make sustainable decisions. Mm -hmm. And this conversion and decarbonization effort, and, we're quite involved in the education space now, Pure House, and we're seeing that lots and lots of government funds are being set up and money is being directed at education. They, yeah. they want to educate yes, people. Yes, true. true. And from there, educate the workforce, mm -hmm. upskill them, and slowly bring in um, the renewables. They want to do it fast. Mm -hmm. The reality is it'll be slow. Yeah. But what we're going to get is we're going to get this green swan emerge, and it'll be a beautiful thing. It will be prosperity for all those that are on it, um, I often liken it to a rising wave, you know, and, mm -hmm. and the rising wave, this will be the biggest one I'll ever see mm -hmm. in my lifetime um, for sustainability. You know, will it hit in 2027? Will it hit in 2030? Will it hit in 2035? I don't know. What I do know is right here, right now, is me getting ready and being on yeah. that wave as it's just starting to build and as it washes in. Um, for investors, you know, mm -hmm. there is a great financial uh, opportunity to ride that wave. Um, but it's got to start with education. They've got to be in at the right time. Yeah, yeah. Would you have bought Tesla shares back when you didn't know what Tesla was? Well, you wouldn't. But uh, what would you have liked? To? Yeah, yeah. Now, on, uh, looking back, of <laughs> course, yeah, hindsight is very valuable. Back with that coffee yeah. shop opportunity that got offered to me, somebody told me about Tesla and said, buy some Tesla shares. <laughs> What's Tesla? Well, in fact, I endorse your, your comment on the coffee because my wife treated me to a, an espresso machine and we just love it, you know, absolutely love it. But what's wrong <laughs> what with Nescaf? Uh, mm, different, something about the quality. <laughs> and, you, and you ask me... And I'm not it, knocking Nescaf here. But are you asking if people are prepared to pay for coffee? Well, that's, that's the thing. You have to pay extra for it. Obviously, yeah. Uh, and, do you, yeah. and do people have that uh, means and do they want to make those decisions? Yeah, yeah. Um, from what I've seen, yes is the answer. If they can make a better sustainable option, um, they will do. So, you know, what's next for the investor, I suppose, when it comes mm. to property market and yeah. where we're going? So our homes, we're pursuing the passive house mm. certification. That is by far the leading uh, sustainable standard. Yeah. You look at an EPC rating A. Sorry, but it means nothing. Mm. Uh, most people have never seen an EPC rating A. Mm. It's done on a 30 minute assessment of the yeah. building. Yeah. So even if it has one, it really doesn't mean much no. because you, you can't assess the quality of what's going on there. Um, will people buy a, an EPC rating A and will they pay more? Mm. Yes is the answer. We're pursuing passive house um, certification, which is way, way beyond that. Yeah. And, and you know it guarantees us being up in, in that category of branding. Um, and we'll we'll see people doing the maths. They'll do the maths on, you know, like they do on a car. Yeah. How much is it electricity per kilowatt? How many miles am I going to get per kilowatt hour? 
people will do the maths on it, but fundamentally they're still going to be driven by the mm. emotion and the desire to own something better, own something sustainable, and know they're doing their bit for their families. So we're expecting people to um, really step up um, and see the extra value that we're putting yeah. into the scheme. We're going to sell them more, yeah, and it will cost them more. But when it comes down to value, I tell you what, they will get tenfold the value out of a house built to this standard than if they bought from any one of the big house builders. I think you can see that, and uh, we, you know, when you think back, David, in this short period, you've gone from two, now you're on twenty, and I'm sure the next one will be even more so. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is it. It's yeah, progressing. Um, and when I talk to investors about our business and you know the opportunities we're offering to them, I'm constantly reminding them that. This isn't about 20 homes. Mm. This is about a prototype scheme yeah. that's starting to de um, yeah. demonstrate scale. Yeah. You can build 20 and make a, a decent business model out mm. of it. You can go on to build 50. Yes, of 50, course. you can do 200. Yeah. There's no reason why the next town in the UK to be built shouldn't be aspired to you mm. know, these standards. Love it. Superb. Now, have we any questions from any of our... Uh... Uh, delegates at all? Do we yeah, need... feel free to to load up any Please. questions. Yeah. Um, probably now is a good time to pick up on those. Uh, the first question is: I want to build sustainably. Where should I start? Where should you start? Um, okay, so preparation is in everything. So um, the way that Pure House sees it, and the way that we promote ourselves, is design and build. Because I'm building education, uh, and often me and Kevin have the debate of can't we put education at the front? Mm. You start with education, right? But fundamentally, once you are educated and you understand, design the right house. Um, and in designing the right house, I'm talking about not over specking it, not yeah. under specking it. And mm. um, go and get educated. There's there's um, numerous training courses out there. I do recommend Zero Energy. Uh, look them up. They're in Manchester. Um, they provide a lot of passive house training. You can register on our website. We've got the School of Excellence for, for Pure House. Um, we are in the process of um, rolling out a scheme nationally uh, through colleges. Um, and the idea there is we train the younger people in the workforce. Um, within, um, by registering on our website, if we get uh, or when we get the government funding needed to roll out training courses, you'll be the first people to be notified. Um, start with education, then find yourself a good designer. Mm. That designer, should know about passive house and running a, a PHPP, PHPP, so planning, uh, passive house planning package. That is what's going to give you an optimum build. So if you want to build sustainably, build optimally, make your money and your pennies go as far as they can, design it first. It'll cost you a few thousand pounds to go through this process. But as I've mentioned before, you know, an air source heat pump, if you put that on one of our homes, that's 15 grand mm -hmm. just in the bin. Yeah. Because yeah, we don't need yeah. it. No, no. But it could be very easy to make that decision of I'm building sustainably. I'm going to slap solar panels on the roof, air source heat pump in there, do some insulation, and away I go. Get the performance right. PHPP has been tested now for the last 30, 30 plus years. Um, and it tells you exactly, like the performance gap is like that, Keith. Yeah, yeah. We design it, we know what it's going to perform like, and it does, and they've proven this time and time brilliant. again. I, just, just brilliant. I think it's a good point as well at this stage, David, to just mention the website, which is Pure House, H A U S O yeah, Word. Stop the German word. UK. Um, obviously, LinkedIn, uh, and again, important to note, David Bradley Bowles. That's it. If you, if you Google <coughs> David Bradley Bowles, message, I'm the only yeah. one out there. Um, I mean, anyone can obviously as well contact me, and I'll put you in touch with David. Um, so uh, please make sure that you've got all the details and we really look forward to hearing from you. Have we any any other questions? Yes, the second one is, what is the difference between PPC and PHPP? Okay, so I think I've probably, I don't know, we co uh, cover this again just for, for clarity. So an EPC is a 30 minute assessment. They walk in, they have a look, they estimate what might be in your cavity in terms of insulation, what's in the roof, what type of windows you've got, do you have any kind of renewables bolt on? And within 30 minutes, they give you a rubber stamp to say that is the energy performance of mm -hmm. your house. Hugely, hugely inaccurate. If we were to do an assessment of an old building, so do the you know a similar um, process to doing an EPC on an existing building, we'd spend a day doing a survey. Uh, our surveyors would be measuring the depth of the windows from the, the, the return of the front of the building 
we go into so much detail and then we can do a 3D model of the building. That takes us a day to do. Uh, and then we output that into the PHPP, which is the calculator. It's a, it's a massive spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. And through 3D modeling and doing a detailed survey, all of a sudden we know exactly how much energy that building is going to, to uh, need. And you can hold a PHPP and an EPC side by side. One tells you on a 30 minute assessment whether it's good or not, but really doesn't have any evidence to back it up. The other one, you could sleep. Uh, sleep well at night knowing that those figures uh, are accurate and if you've got that and you're thinking about a retrofit um it gives you the information you need to then go so this is my starting point yeah yeah that's where i want to get to mm. what do i need to do on that journey perfect lovely the third question is can you get discounted developer loans can you get uh, discounted developer loans uh, yes you can so we're seeing in the marketplace, uh, backed by Homes England, um, in one instance, they're offering the finance companies the opportunity to give a discount, and then it's subsidized by the government. Um, if you were to build to passive house, you might see two or 3% knocked off your uh, developer loan finance. So if you're paying something like 7%, you could be actually be paying more like 4.5%, something like that. Um, so yeah, there are incentives out there and that's, again, like I said, it's backed by government. I think there's a few others, what you want to be looking for when you are out there and talking to a, a broker about this, um, things like, um, ESG, so envir environmental social, social governance. governance. Yeah. Yeah. And that is, that's a booming market as well. And they're pumping money into the areas yeah. that they think are going to help with the, um, sustainability progression, should we say. And that very much that you mentioned that ESG, David, with our corporate sponsors, with, with the children's books, messages for children covering their uh, ESG agenda. Yeah, very, very much so. Uh, good. Are we doing so, for time? Uh, we have 15 minutes more. Uh, the second question is, are you registered for EIS investments? Ah, good question. Now, well, that's it. That's a very good question. We mentioned that yesterday. Yeah. Do you want to explain what EIS? Uh, EI, well, of what, course, yeah. <laughs> it is for, for the benefit of those it, that yeah. don't know. Those that um, Enterprise Investment Scheme gives you those extra tax benefits on the investment that you're putting in. We did mention that yesterday, David. And, uh, just your your this is on your agenda, isn't it? Yeah, massively. So we started out as a developer, yeah. uh, and the first thing I said was to the accountant, "Can we get?" Uh, C's and EIS, uh, and the answer was, no, you're a developer. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Um, but our journey as a, as a company has actually progressed now quite far on. So we started off as a developer, and they're not interested in supporting that. It's much more about uh, manufacturing and research and service-based uh, companies and software-based yeah. companies. Um, but now we're providing design, build, education. We're no longer just a developer, and we can provide services. Um, so we're aware we've now progressed into yeah. a space where that kind of investment um, is certainly going to be applicable. And yeah, it's definitely on our agenda to open up the opportunity for investors to work with us. And I, I encourage yourselves to look into setting yourselves up to be able to generate that kind of investment because the investors, it's, it's a no brainer for them because uh, of the, the tax breaks. <clears throat> and I, I think, you know, on that particular point, uh, as we arrived at the university this morning for this, and I introduced you to my colleague and uh, mentioned what you were doing. And the first comment was one of the major banks have just got a development fund and she feels that this will be way up the agenda. Yeah. So that's another positive yeah, one there, David. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I am spoiled for opportunities mm. to explore. Mm, yeah. Um, and there is a part of me that right now <laughs> is just going, I'm on with building 20 houses. Yeah. You know, there's very, very few people in the country that can help with this project because it's niche knowledge. But actually, that's the exciting thing is we've managed to bring together some of the best people in the country because it's such a small network. Yeah. You can pick up the phone to these people that have got these expertise and we can bring that expertise in, design what we're doing and move forward. But sometimes you do have to shut off opportunities <laughs> because you get bombarded with it. Well. I think I've kept your email box busy this week, David. Yeah, you, you, you certainly have. That's it. Lots and lots of opportunities, whether it's uh, people wanting to yeah. have their land built, you know, the way we build, people wanting to fund what we build, people wanting to do their own building work. Mm -hmm. um, I'll tell you what, you know, coming back to boom and bust, um, as a developer, one of our biggest challenges, um, the legal system and the planning system. Mm, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
time. Um, we can build houses yeah. to this standard in no time at all. We mm. can design them under our mm. own space. What we can't do is reinvent the prehistoric planning. Um, yeah. Leeds City Council have been brilliant um, working with us. It's taken us a long, mm. long time. They've From day one, they were on board with our scheme. Yeah, there will be. But the, the box ticking mm. exercise mm. Um, and the, the, you know, the processes you have to go through very, very archaic, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's meant that it's taken us longer to get through planning than it will do build. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. Um, and legally, you know, our um, property conveyancing process, you know, you look at how they do it in Europe, and 30 days they're yeah. done. This country, 12 um, months is not uncommon. Dare I say it, it's like building railways. Oh. <laughs> building railways, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, uh, another question? question? Yes. Uh, can you tell me about the thermopod? Thermopod, yeah. So I mentioned the thermopod earlier. So this for me is like our um, one of our renewable sources that we're going to put in at Spring Meadows. And uh, imagine two radiators, just skinny little radiators, size of a solar panel. In fact, the problem more like a solar panel. Hmm. We're going to bob them somewhere where they get a draft. So in our case, we're going to put them up on the roof next to the solar panels. Um, and they work like a, a fridge, reverse fridge. Um, so what's going to happen is the, the chemicals inside the radiator uh, we'll have a chemical reaction based on the change in heat. So I'm getting really technical here, so apologies for those that, that don't do the technical stuff. That's going to bring the heat into the house. It'll go through a little heat exchanger in the building, and that will actually provide sufficient heat to keep our hot water for cooking, cleaning, showering. That'll provide enough heat for that. It'll also provide enough heat to run the towel radiators, mm. and we put all that energy straight into a hot water cylinder. Um, and it's a fraction of the price of an air source heat pump. Amazing. Yeah, it's an exciting piece of kit. Um, most houses wouldn't benefit from it because they need shed loads of energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you see niche knowledge as a potential issue as I'm seeing such a disparity of understanding and knowledge across the development sector? Mm -hmm. And how can we change this? Yeah, I mean, we're talking... so. We're talking about greenwashing here, mm. aren't we? Uh, niche knowledge, dangerous that um, that knowledge is either misused or ill-informed people providing, you know, consultants that haven't got the right training. They think an air source heat pump is a good thing. I I'm going to touch on that, actually, because there is such a big wave of money coming in for air source heat pumps. Mm. Less than 1% of houses in this country probably would benefit from one. Oh. But they're trying to put them in every house. If you have one put in your house, the, the, the engineering behind it is they run on a very low level uh, heat temperature. Right. But your house is probably not going to warm up as fast as you like, and it's probably mm. going to cool quicker than the warming is happening. So you're going to run it all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. Electricity is not cheap right no, now. No, it isn't. I can, I, can, I can hand on my heart say, very likely your energy bills are going up if you install an air source heat pump. Goodness gracious. Mate. And they're trying to force these in everywhere. Now, this is about ill informed education, yeah. consultants, professionals steering governments, local authorities on this agenda. Um, is the knowledge available? Yeah, I would say join certain networks. We've got two mm -hmm. fantastic networks I recommend the Passive House Trust. So it's a members organization. They get lots of, um, they're getting lots of educational material out there for their members, and they've got huge databases of uh, resources. We're working with them on a collaboration project to get education out there. And the other one is the AECB as well. So AECB. Um, and it's all about sustainable construction. Mm. Both of those organizations, they're going to give you good information. But you can also look up consultants that are members of those organizations. That's how you know you get um, a decent consultant. Is, look up where you're going first or speak with someone like myself that may have got the experience. So the knowledge is out there. It is available. You do need to have a filter on when you're trying to pick who you're going to work with. Um, be very mindful of greenwashing. There are a lot of people selling a lot of crap information out there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and be astute, you know, it's, it's, it's the same. Investors generally are pretty astute. They don't, t you know, they take things with a pinch of salt when they're, they're being sold the dream. This is no different. I don't think anyone this morning, David, can um, come away from this uh, without noting your passion for it. Uh, and ob you. obviously, if people need that advice, as you've said already, you're there to give it. So I, I think it's just worth 
uh, for our listeners, our, our guests, uh, Pure House, all one word, haus.co.uk, David Bradley Bowles on LinkedIn. And if you do need to be put in touch with David, you can always come to me, Keith Medley, and I will make the link. Um, what next for investors? I, I look, take the, you know, the, the, hopefully the golden gems that I've shared with you. Um, I, I welcome to continue conversations on with people. Um, go out there and educate yourself. That's, that's the big thing that I would encourage because I'm now five years into this journey. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I look at sustainability very, very differently to mm -hmm. how I did five years ago. And in five or 10 years time, um, this market, you know, has got huge potential. So do start with education. I hope you can, you know, take what I've shared yeah. today for benefit. If I can help you in any way, feel free. As, as Keith said, he's given contact details there. Um, for those of you that go out there and do your own investing, um, I'm, I'm actually going to literally plead with you to say, please do invest into sustainability. Um, it's the only way for us to drive change in the built environment. We are a minority. The major house builders in the UK are um, pushing their agenda and it is not sustainability. And when they see that this minority are doing exceptionally well out of it, and we are shaking up the market, it will change the way they build too. And that is how we reinvent the property market. Um, so yeah, go out there, do as, do as you can, um, invest into sustainability. If you are an investor and actually time is not something you have and the education and the journey that you're going on is, um, you know, you don't have the capacity, get in touch with us. We've always got opportunities for investors uh, to work with us. We need to build a team around us in the same way you need to build a team around you if we're going to, um, I'm going to say, obliterate what we know as the traditional construction market. Well, no more questions, mm -hmm. I gather, from our colleague. So uh, shall we say, in conclusion, are we really seeing the beginning of the end of Fossil? Is Clara's future always going to be challenged or will she emerge victorious? as an early adopted. Will she ride the rising wave and will the green swan emerge, David? <laughs> I certainly hope so. <laughs> if you enjoyed today, please uh, share the video uh, on social, your social channels and so forth. And please feel free to contact us if you need any more information. Thank you, David. That's been really interesting. Uh, thank I've you, Keith. Even learned more from what I've already learned from you today. Thank e you for that. Excellent. And thank you, listeners, for, uh, for joining us. Thank you, Take everybody. Care.